There are no constraints on the human mind. No walls around the human spirit. No barriers to our progress except those we ourselves erect. Make your life a story worth telling. Okay, and welcome to Kazcast episode 16. Today on the podcast, we welcome Dr. Casey Lowy. In 2010, Casey gained a bachelor's degree in chemistry and became a chiropractor after attending the Los Angeles College of Chiropractic in 2013. Casey is now in her sixth year of practice as a chiropractor, working in the west side of Los Angeles, helping a huge amount of people. Casey has said, my main focus when it comes to patients is educating them on the benefits of moving well. This not only gives them some relief, but helps to change their biomechanics and postural habits. This creates a stronger foundation, which then helps my patients become less prone to injury. As well as working with her patients, Casey has worked with athletes from Santa Monica High School and cheerleaders from the San Diego Chargers. Casey has also competed as a powerlifter, competing in four USAPL competitions in the last five years. So thanks very much, Casey, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. No, you're welcome. Um, so what I wanted to ask you first, so going back in uh, to 2010, uh, when you completed your chemistry degree, uh, did you know at the time the path that you wanted to take after you completed that degree? Um, and, and what was your, did you have like a long-term plan or how did that work out for you? Yeah, well, I always knew that I wanted to work with people and I actually considered being a teacher um, and become possibly becoming a principal, but I always knew that I wanted to advance my education to the doctorate level. I just wasn't sure what at the time. Um, so while I was in undergrad, like all my friends that like I was hanging out with were going into different directions of medicine or research kind of made me go through my own like exploratory process. I changed to a more like, pre-med route. Like I tried my hands in organic chem research lab. I was studying flavonoids related to cancer. I mean, I even interned at a maternity ward um, in undergrad. So I was just trying my hand at everything just to figure out what, what I wanted to do. And at some point I realized I, wanted to help people in a different way. I just was actually having a casual conversation with my mom about, you know, where all of this was leading to. And she was just like, what about chiropractic? And I realized I was always interested in health prevention. Health prevention. It just kind of made sense with my background. I was actually a personal trainer in college. Um, so I was super into health and fitness, playing soccer, working out. Um, it just kind of all made sense. And the more that I researched it, I actually – have been seeing a chiropractor since I was 14. I was in a car accident and I was getting really bad headaches and and I just realized how it helped me and helped my family and it just kind of all clicked. Yeah, okay, brilliant. And is that uh, a common route? I mean, getting into uh, to, to becoming a chiropractor, um, have people also done the same route as you? Did they study chemistry or is, is that a route that's been done before or do you think that's quite new, unique to you? Um. I don't necessarily think it's unique. I think a lot of people do like a science route to get into uh, any sort of like doctorate yeah. medicine program, uh, but it's not always the case. Like you can just get all the basic prereqs that you need, you know, whether it be like the biochem and physics, and then you could still get a degree in something totally different, but still get all your prereqs for, yeah. you know, uh, a chiropractic school. Okay. Okay. So you went. Um, so, so you studied uh, chemistry, and, and how long were you studying for? It was four years. It was four. Yeah. It was four years undergrad. Okay. Um, and then after four years, what what did you go on to from there? So I I went straight to chiropractic school. Okay. Right after. Yeah. Um, so that was like about three and a half years. It's ten like trimesters, so it's all year round. Yeah. Um, okay. So you learn all the basic sciences same as a medical doctor we just kind of focus more hands on um on diagnosis of you know the spine and 
treat kind of different pathology um, mm. and obviously on the chiropractic techniques and x-rays. Yeah, okay. And you studied in New York, but then you made the switch to LA when you became a chiropractor? Is that right? So actually, I went straight to chiropractic school in LA. Okay. I did my undergrad in New York, and I realized I wanted to go somewhere new and I, that I've never been somewhere sunny <laughs> yeah definitely nice that's a good yeah good move um so you you had some you said you had some treatment done from a chiropractor um so 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 what was that for and and sort of how quickly did you see the benefits from having that treatment well I was 14 at the time I don't remember everything but I do remember yeah. that I was I felt better after going for a while and then I would just kind of go as maintenance when I needed to Okay. throughout the years while I was in high school and college, whenever I'd come home. Yeah. Um, and I just noticed I never really had, you know, that many injuries Yeah. while seeing him. Okay. Yeah. And when you, uh, and you said during college, you, uh, was a personal trainer. Did you find when yeah. you, you was training people that, um, sort of missing link was, um, it was there you wasn't able to perhaps offer people the, the rehabilitation that you wanted was it like people yeah. um you couldn't help people as much with injuries and that's a route that you really wanted to go down to to help people get back to to fitness you knew that was your calling yeah yeah no um yeah. it all kind of made sense yeah in that time i but yeah that's definitely thinking about it that's definitely it's one of the things that i didn't you know have the education and background on yeah. So I wasn't able to, you know, relay that. And I could see, you know, when you were a personal trainer, you didn't really keep those people for so long. It would, you know, kind of come and go. And yeah. so you wanted to make sure you were helping them a lot, you know. Yeah, right. for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so could you just go into uh, a little bit of detail um, about what a a chiropractor uh, does and and the benefits you can get from having that treatment because I think for some people who have never uh, seen a chiropractor they might know it is sort of cracking your bones a little bit but some people don't know the sort of science behind it and sort of what's happening would you be able to give like a brief description of, of sort of what's, what's going on there? Sure we you know we're evaluating and diagnosing issues that pertain to the neuromusculoskeletal system so basically any joint in the body what we're trying to do is restore and facilitate that movement as well as enhance the body's like function through all the different techniques that we do. Um, so whether that be, you know, we don't always do an x-ray on everyone, but, you know, doing a thorough exam, looking at their range of motion, you know, looking at different drugs in the body with orthopedics so looking if it's a issue a nerve issue and, and so forth to figure out what's going to be the best treatment for them yeah but overall trying to help bring down that inflammation increase their range of motion um help with their you know activities of daily living and whatever other things that they're looking for okay so what's happening there with when someone's um say their joints are being uh, they feel stiff they feel painful if someone's not exercising and, and moving the body what what's actually happening to, to the joints themselves well for example if say they have an injury um it could be something like that's macro or micro so what meaning like they were in a car accident or they lifted something wrong in the wrong way or or something micro like something repetitive like they're sitting at a desk all day or um something like, you know, shoulder impingement, so like a thrower, for example, athlete, you know, that repetitiveness, and they're not doing the proper recovery or prehab stuff to help with that, as well as, you know, working on the tissues and the joints. Basically, what happens is the body starts to guard all those muscles, and the tissues start to guard to protect the spine, so it creates this kind of like, you know, sheet over it, and or like scar tissue buildup, and what happens is, the joints kind of rotate, causing um, all those issues to occur, like whether it be discomfort, sharp pain, soreness, tenderness, pressure, achy, dull, all those kind of like symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's happening, basically. So what we want to do is break up that 
scar tissue so the body can move a little bit better. Yes, inflammation is normal and the way the body's supposed to heal, but if you don't work on getting that mobility back, it's going to take either longer to heal or recreate these, um, you know, that scar tissue kind of stays the same and then things can start to, you know, lock up more. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the uh, techniques uh, that you use, um, you, you know, with, with your patients? I know at the start I've read about, um, you know, one of your main goals is to, you know, is to really get people moving better and, and like improving their uh, biomechanics. Could you talk a little bit about um, like the techniques that you use um, that, that really help people move better and, and how that links in? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So if I not only do the you know, chiropractic adjustment, which is obviously so powerful, but I do incorporate incorporate a lot of physiotherapy techniques. So whether that be passive rehab, you know, I do a lot of electrical stimulation and ultrasound on certain areas that helps bring blood to the area and relax the muscle. It helps everything else, part of the, all the other parts of the treatment work better and your body hold on to everything that we're doing. Um, I also sometimes use, um, rock blade which is like a form of grassin or gua sha like a to break up the scar tissue Mm -hmm. or i'll do trigger point therapy myofascial release technique so like working on the muscle and active ranges of motion yeah which is another way to get blood flow to the area and get mobility and then well as adjusting certain areas that the patient needs um i do see a lot of low back issues so i have some extra you know techniques and the tools that i use for that i have a special table called flexion distraction okay. therapy as well as decompression yeah. which is um really good for opening up compression in the spine or disc herniations yeah. i do see a lot of people who are you know wait till they're at that level till they come in um but it really is customized and tailored to the patient and, and what's going on yeah yeah for sure okay um you said about uh which I think is really interesting and not a lot of people, um, perhaps if you're not in the fitness world, would have heard of it, but the myofascial, myofascial release techniques that you do. Could you talk a, bit, a little bit about uh, the fascia and what it is and and uh, if you don't use those techniques, uh, what what's happening there and, and how can that cause uh, like imbalances in the body if, if you don't address it? Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's really important to work on the soft tissue as well as the joints in the body because if you just adjust, your the body will feel some relief, but if you're not changing the structure of the fascia and the tissue, then it will kind of revert back to its old biomechanics that okay. it's adapted to. You so know, it's like a kind of like a short, or, yeah, a short term fix if you don't if you don't address the fascia as, as well as doing the release techniques, you need to address that as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then as well as that active rehab, working on like different activation um, exercises, you know, um, working on core stability, breathing techniques. But again, whatever is the patient, um, whatever is going on with the patient and their issue. But yeah, it's incorporating all those things. But there's a process to it, too. You don't want to do all of those things at once. Yeah. You know, it takes time for the body to get used to certain things and certain movements. So if you kind of put it on overload, you know, they'll be sore, that muscle memory will be off and they won't be able to, you know, do what they want to do. So yeah, there is like steps to that as well. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, You said earlier about uh, working with people with bad lower back pain. And I'm guessing as, as a chiropractor and in your field of work, you must come across so many people with, with bad backs. Um, What, uh, if you could give some advice to, to people, um, just a few tips on, um, you know, how to sort of prevent back pain in the first place. And if you are suffering from it, is there anything, uh, you know, that people can just start doing now that's going to help reduce those uh, symptoms of back pain? Yeah. Again, like I mentioned, there's like so many different causes of back pain, whether it be yeah. like something traumatic or something you're repetitively doing like poor biomechanics, poor posture every day. So it depends, but you want to make sure that you have a good, you know, foundation and good core stabilization Mm -hmm. and good mobility in your hips. So whether that be making sure you like do stretches every day, um, 
get blood flow to the area, whether that be like some sort of foam rolling or ball work on certain muscles around the joints, or whether that be um, just getting up and making sure you're moving and you're not staying in one position for long periods of time. I mean, it could be something as simple as wearing like a more supportive shoe. So Mm -hmm. there's so many various ways. It just depends on like what level you're at. And, you know, it could, because some people don't do anything at all. Yeah. So if you just show them a couple hip stretches, then they're like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I can move it a little bit better versus yeah. someone who's more, ex- you know, experienced or more um, like an athlete. Yeah. Or someone who's used to working out all the time, maybe making sure looking at their technique a little bit. Yeah. Making sure they're doing that recovery or making sure they're warming up correctly. So it could be, yeah, a few of those things. Yeah, because some people... You know, some people get bad lower backs because they don't do anything. And then some people get bad lower backs because they do too much. So it's kind of, um, yeah, it's kind of getting people in the middle there. And like you say, you must come right, across. Right, you want that. Yeah, yeah. You want that, like, moderation and balance between both. Uh-huh. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in terms of, uh, like, creating, a uh, like, a strong foundation, um, if you had to give, like, if you was you want to give someone a, a piece of paper with like four or five things on there they must do weekly um, in terms of um, creating like a, a strong, solid foundation within the body. Um, just for someone who, uh, you know, just wants to be fit and healthy. What, what do you think some, some things are that, that people should be doing like on a weekly basis? Just really basic things. Um, you've probably mentioned a few of them already about doing some stretches and, and foam rolling. Um, but what would you suggest uh to people in terms of creating that strong foundation yeah well i mean for example if we just take the low back like the main things that i go over is core stabilization and that could not just mean doing core work but you know learning how to use the core so learning diaphragmatic breathing belly breathing because a lot of people tend to be shallow breathers Mm -hmm. and that can cause a lot of issues in the low in the upper back or low back so learning how to breathe properly yeah Um, learning how to sit to stand properly making sure they're not just taking all these like everyday things for granted like you know your posture is so important so if you're just you know not bracing properly and you're not using your glutes because some people think core is just your abs yeah or like your abdomen area but it's multiple areas it's you know i kind of sometimes think of it as a Edwards triangle, like it's your core, your glutes, your your upper back, shoulder stabilizers. Mm-hmm. Um, all those things have to be working together for you to be able to do these everyday things, like pick something up properly, go sit to stand, get up off the couch, get out of bed. Yeah. All those things, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting actually. You saying about the breathing in uh, one of my previous podcasts, I spoke to this guy who was. Uh, a Wim Hof uh, instructor and you know Wim Hof's all about uh, the cold therapy and using the the, mm. the breathing the breathing techniques um, and it was really interesting could uh, y- you go into a little bit more detail about the breathing and, and why it's so important and um, uh, and what are the the negative effects of you know someone that's just doing shallow breathing I mean what why is uh, you know your breath sort of so important yeah of course um so basically, when we're breathing through our diaphragm, you get more stabilization there. You get yeah. Um, breathing through your chest, you're using such smaller muscles and those intercostal muscles in between the rib cage, and then that can create a lot of tension and stress in the neck and upper back, and even the low back. Versus breathing through the bigger muscles, um, which helps create that like stabilization. And you're less prone to poor posture. You're less prone to injuries. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It all links in. And something as basic as as breathing, I just don't think people are aware of that, of how beneficial that something that yeah. basic can actually be. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, you said earlier about uh, uh, foam rolling. That is something yeah. that, you know, especially like with CrossFit and a lot of guys are, 
you know, they're always foam rolling at the end of workouts and you see athletes warming up with foam rollers. Um, and the great thing about a foam roller is it's so cheap and you can just, you know, just have it at home. Um, would you say that's a, like a must have for, for people that are active, uh, do a lot of sport, you know, do some weights, work out, go running? Um, how important is uh, foam rolling, would you say? I actually recommend it to all my patients, whether they be super active or they like do something twice a week. Yeah. Because most of the time they're in a position, you know, for too long, whether it be like standing all day or sitting all day, they need to get blood flow to that area. And you're not doing that when you don't do anything. So foam rolling, you know, your thoracic area, your mid back, foam rolling, you know, your serratus, lat area, like underneath your armpit, foam rolling everywhere around your hip. It just opens everything up a little bit better and yeah. gets your joints moving better. Yeah. So I think it, I mean, studies show too that it helps increase that mobility. Yeah, for sure. And uh, how important is uh, mobility? And also, could you uh, talk about the difference between um, someone having good mobility and, and someone being flexible, um, sort of the difference between yeah. between the two, um, because I I saw on your um, on your Instagram page is brilliant at all the little uh, videos you put up about mobility and and uh, you know the area that it's hitting in the body and it's really simple and easy to follow. Um, so I'll put when I post this podcast i'll put all your social media links up so people can check out your videos because they're really good on instagram um but what is um uh, why is mobility so important and yeah sort of how is it different to you know being flexible yeah um so some people it's a little bit genetic if they have like that hyper mobility or hyper flexibility in the joints yeah so then it's like again where you want to keep that moderation if you have that hyper mobility in the joints then you want to work on stabilization and strengthening around that area so you're not like always pushing past that end ring yeah versus someone who's like super super stiff in their joints we it's not just getting that flexibility but it's creating more motion in certain joints okay. so it's finding that balance in between yeah you don't want to be over mobile or flexible because again, that's also you can be prone to injuries because you have too much range, range of motion when you're doing a certain activity, and that can lead to issues if you're not staying nice, locked up, and tight when you're doing maybe, for example, like a squat. Yeah. Exam. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. It's it like you say, it's getting that that balance between the two again. You want to be bracing yourself and being strong at the joints, but having enough mobility to get into the right positions. Um, to perform the, the, the exercises. Um, where where in the body do you think most people lack mobility and what what are sort of the key areas to uh, to focus on? And, and is there like a, um, a certain amount people should be doing or a certain time of day or before a workout or after? Could you give a little bit of advice on, on that? Yeah. Um, so as far as like when they should do things before and after workouts, I like to say doing dynamic movements before. So you can do a stretch, but in a mobile form. So you're stretching, but moving at the same time, whether that be holding it less than 15 seconds. Um, yeah. So there are things that you can do that are like a static stretch, but I don't say it's static because you're not holding it past the range of, you know, 30 seconds so that your body is actually knowing it's a stretch. So doing dynamic movement, whether it be, like hugging your knee to your chest as you walk and you do that, like a high knee or yeah. whether you shift your hips back and forth or work on like internal rotation of the hip and the shoulder um, with a weight, um, but super light. And then doing the those static stretches at the end of your workout. Yeah. Um, but foam rolling, I, I recommend doing before and after because okay. you want to get the body warm, but then you also want to break down that tissue as well at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then what was your first question? I, I missed it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what? I can't actually remember, but I think, uh, <laughs> I think you summed it up nicely there. That, that's good. Um, in terms of the tissue and, uh, you breaking it down with the, with the foam roller, what, um, 
uh, what could you just explain what uh, scar tissue is and and how that can have a negative effect on the body and and how long does it take uh, you know is it easy enough to break down or is it a bit stubborn takes a bit of work uh, could you talk a little bit about scar tissue yeah. just if people aren't sure well, it depends. Yeah. yeah of course I mean it depends on the person whether it's a chronic injury or something that's acute um, you know it could be easier and faster to heal versus something that someone's had for months um, basically scar tissue like if the body heals around that area it should be nice and smooth but okay. what happens is it starts to kind of like crisscross around that area right and that creates that like friction so yeah. you and then also creates that um area where the joint's not able to move as well so you need to open up that soft tissue a little bit better and that scar tissue before you can even move in the right area right so we want to start to stretch and open up in the right area and then strengthen around it we can't strengthen in the wrong position when that scar tissue is still there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you'll do. There's, I suppose there's, there's just going to be a limit to it. You've got to take one step back to take two forward, I guess, with that. Right. Yeah. So again, that yeah. like it's hard to say exactly when how fast your body's going to heal. It really depends on the issue. Mm -hmm. But something that's probably you've never had before and just happened could be probably a little bit easier of a fix than something that you've had for a long period of time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so I wanted to uh, actually ask you about uh, some of the uh, the work that you got involved with um, with some athletes. So I said at the start in your introduction that you'd work with some athletes from uh, Santa Monica High School and also worked with some cheerleaders from the uh, San Diego Chargers. So how did that come about for you? And um, was that was you just solely working as a chiropractor and, and what, what did your work look like when you were there? Yeah. So I was involved in everything in chiropractic school because I also wanted to know every technique and know every facet. So I could again, figure out what was the best way that I wanted to practice and help people. Um, so I had some great mentors in school. Um, one of them being Dr. Mindy Marr. She happened to be the chiropractor for the San Diego Charger cheerleaders, and she worked with the Paralympic teams and various other sports. So kind of working with her, and I did a lot of things in school. I, w I was on the sports medicine team for the wildflower triathlon, which is like um, basically cycling, um, sorry, swimming, cycling, and running. So mm -hmm. look, helping all those athletes, and then the what's called AIDS life cycle is every year. So I was on the sports med team for these people who are helping, you know, raise money for AIDS like um, and HIV and helping them treat them while they were doing this everyday cycling for seven days. Yeah. Um, so just being around, you know, as many mentors as I could that were in these avenues and just talking to the right people. Mm -hmm. So when I was working with the, the charger cheerleaders, I was helping out with the medical interviews um, so doing physicals with them. And then also if they ever needed anyone off the field, they would come see me in my office okay. and we work on specific injuries that yeah. they were having. And so that way they can get back into everything faster as okay. far as, um, the dancing and everything. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. And is it common, um, in, uh, in the States for, uh, you know, professional sports teams um, and, and high schools and, and different uh, businesses to have on board um, a chiropractor as well as, uh, say, a physiotherapist or like strength and conditioning coaches. Are you part of like a big team, like another, uh, you know, another sort of cog in the wheel? Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's really common. Like almost every single NFL team has a whole slew of, you know, people and one of them being a chiropractor yeah um also like all the olympic teams have a whole team of people and a lot of the olympic docs are the chiropractors for them but there's also you know physical therapists athletic trainers massage therapists so there yeah. is everyone but yeah there are a lot of chiros in all those fields especially with athletes because we're trying again to help get them back into playing and that's yeah part of what we do yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's another it's another skill set. I know that uh, you probably might know who I'm talking about. I can't actually remember uh, the guy's name, but I'm a big uh, 
UFC fan and there's a chiropractor who works for the UFC and there's a ton of videos oh. on him on YouTube. Yes. Giving people. I know who you're talking about. Do you know who I mean? He's from New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's Bo, Dr. Bo. That's Harper. right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I've seen yeah, him he, a lot yeah. and I know he works for the UFC and he's always, um, yeah, he, he's always doing a lot of work on these, uh, on these UFC fighters. And obviously these are really tough people, but. Yeah, oh, they yeah. don't they don't look look that watched, tough like, when they're with him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he... no, yeah. He he posts a lot of really cool stuff. Um I think he's like a and D C and he's a naturopath and he teaches too, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I even saw this one technique, um, where it was almost like a hammer and a chisel that he was using on this guy's <laughs> shoulder. It is there's does that yeah. sound does that sound right? <laughs> I don't know the technical yeah, term that. for the, the oh. tool that he was using, but yeah. No, that really is literally what it's called. <laughs> oh, it, that is called that? Okay. It's, it's Lucky just, guess. Yeah. yeah, it's basically another way to break up the tissue. I'm okay. not positive, but I think he may have like created that himself because yeah. I haven't seen that anywhere else. But yeah. yeah. Maybe that's what he needs to use on the UFC fighters because their bodies obviously take <laughs> so much punishment. I suppose he's had to resort to using a hammer and a chisel to yeah get the results yeah. but yeah yeah um cool so in terms of uh your own um like athletic goals um so i said at the start that you um that you got into powerlifting so how did how did uh powerlifting come about for you how did you get involved in that yeah um so again like i said i've always been into health and fitness and college and being a personal trainer i loved working out I first kind of started getting my feet wet in bodybuilding, and I did a figure competition in about 2011. Yeah, and it was a great experience. I I really like liked it, but I didn't think it was maintainable for, you know, throughout my career in school. It was yeah, it's a lot of pressure on the body. Um, so I always like loved getting stronger, and I wanted something where I could do that. And so powerlifting kind of just like made sense and. Also, my husband was doing it at the time, at the time, so, yeah. his, you know, working out together, it was great, so we could kind of share that passion, and and it actually helped all those functional movements, squat, bench, and deadlift, you know, even helped strengthen my foundation as a chiropractor, because we're super hands-on, and we're moving a lot, and we're moving heavy people, and doing a lot of rigorous work throughout the day, so it made me stronger, and able to do all those things, you know, and help my patients as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the sport, if people aren't sure, obviously you've got Olympic lifting, which is like uh, the snatch and the clean and jerk. So with the power lifting, you've got those three, yeah. three main lifts. Um, and then is it that the scores yeah. on all three lifts are added together to get the end uh, score? Yeah, so it's yeah. your best lift out of each one. So you get three okay. chances for each one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And you really enjoyed that competitive part. Did you... in? Obviously, love the training, but did you enjoy the the buzz of competing on the day, the adrenaline of it? You know, it it's, it's so nerve wracking, but at yeah. the end, you're always so happy because it's like a goal that you want to reach and you want to try to lift your heaviest that day. So you usually yeah. hit, you know, some personal records because of the vibe and the energy and the crowd and the and the people around you. Because you know, the people that you are um, um, competing against or just that environment there everyone's so nice and welcoming and it's yeah you know it's not you know you can only do the best that you can do so it's however you how work how hard you've worked throughout that year yeah to be able to lift as much as you can yeah for sure so it's yeah cool. yeah awesome um so in terms of uh them lifts that you're doing um you know those sort of like big compound lifts the positive and the negative negative effects, obviously the positives being that you get strong um, and you strengthen your body and as long as you do the, the technique right and you slowly uh, build those weights up. Um, as in terms of you as a chiropractor looking at those exercises, what can be some of the negative effects that perhaps them lifts have on uh, you know your, your, the, mus the muscles and the joints um, and how um, sort of damaging can them lifts be or are they actually strengthening your body and there's not too many negative effects as long as you're careful with the weights 
if you're looking at it as a chiropractor, how would you sum up the lifts yeah. in terms of the positives and perhaps the negatives that the, the lifts have on the body? Yeah, of course. So when I look at squat bench and deadlift or in a powerlifting setting, you're always doing, like I said, like you said, like performing it in the best way, the best technique possible. Yeah. So whether that be like programming yourself to train, you know, working up to a certain weight, you know, every four to five weeks, and then you do what's like called a deload, which I'm sure you know, um, because you need to give your body that rest time to be able to keep lifting heavy. A lot of people, what they do is they just keep going up, up, up in weight months, 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 and then you lead, that leads to an injury. Yeah. You need to make sure you recover, not just doing your foam rolling and stretching and warming up properly, but like also giving your body that rest time, whether that be like lifting light for that fifth week and then slowly increasing back up again. Yeah. Um, okay. So all those th- movements too are things that we do in our everyday. Like mm-hmm. when you go to sit down in a chair, when you get up out of bed, when you go to pick up your laundry, those are all those movements. So it's helping you, I think, in your everyday life if, again, you're doing them correctly yeah. and safely and you're not overdoing it. Yeah, for sure. So when you're competing and getting ready, say, to, to do a competition, um, how do you uh, structure your training in terms of how many days or like reps and sets and how many weeks do you plan for? Yeah. What does that look for, like roughly for you, if, for your training? Yeah, so it depends when I pick my competition, but I usually try to know a few months ahead of time. And those last, you know, six to eight weeks, anytime when you're training for a competition or like a big event, those last few weeks are going to be tough. Yep. But that's when you have to make sure you do the recovery stuff. So, yeah, for probably like the first four weeks of that three-month block, like it'll go up, but then I'll go usually a deload. And then those next like seven, eight weeks is when you're going pretty hard. Yeah. And then that week, the last two weeks is where you kind of like do what a taper. So you're not lifting that much the weeks yeah. prior, but you're still lifting heavy. Okay. So you're still, your body's still recovering, but you're still trying to keep that muscle memory of the, like, feeling that heavy weight on you. Yeah, yeah. And when you do your workouts, do you just like to get in there, get warmed up, fair, not too long of a session, but keep it intense? Um, and and how, how long do you normally train for? How long do your, do your sessions normally last for? Yeah, well, it depends. Um, my program has changed throughout the years because sometimes your career takes ahead and you have to work more yeah. um, so right now I'm working out four times a week I do like two accessory days I call it so yep. I'm still working on those movements but in different settings and working on the smaller muscles too to work on all my imbalances and yeah make sure I'm working on those and then I'll do like two strong powerlifting days um, and so my workouts could take like an hour and a half yeah. to two hours because I'm shortening my days okay of yeah training yeah yeah it's just trying to condense your training um best you yeah. can yeah okay cool have you got anything uh have you got any competitions coming up that you want to get focused on or are you having a little bit of a break at the moment I have a little bit of break at the moment I mean yeah I feel like you never have a break with with powerlifting you're always yeah. training all year round yeah. so you have to be ready for whenever you pick a competition yeah so it's not necessarily I have a competition in mind. Usually, I like I might do something at the end of the year. Yeah. Um, cause again, it's just it's my hobby. It's for fun, and I love yeah. to do it. So that's why I'm always working out and training all the time. Um, yeah. So not anything right now, but I'm just like enjoying my workouts and learning new things, and I'm actually trying out Olympic weightlifting just to kind of switch up my movements a little bit. So yeah, that's been pretty fun. That's cool. Yeah, awesome. So do you find that when you're consistent with your training that you're able to be more focused with your actual work itself? Um, or do you get like irritable if you don't train or you're one of those people that you have to train and once you do train, you actually become more focused and you can actually work better? Um, do you find it training for you has a lot of mental uh, benefits as well? Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, some I've... I've I've been in that state where like, I feel like I need to work out every single day, but then you realize your body creates these muscle memories yeah. and you don't have to, you know, train seven times a week. Your body still needs to recover. Yeah. So whether it be four or five times a week, getting that movement and whether it be like say, for example, 
things happen in life, you know, you have family come into town or you're traveling, you have to create movement in other ways, but not to stress that even if you don't do those like heavy lifts that week, like that, you're going to lose it all. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. Finding that balance too. Yeah. Yeah. Some people need encouragement to start training and other people need to be held back because they train too much. And, uh, (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's just striking that balance. Um, so in terms of uh, if you was to offer sort of some training tips uh, for people that sort of, you know, they want to focus on longevity and stay injury free, but also get fit um, at, at the same time. Um, so what sort of tips in terms of training wise would you offer to people that just want to work on uh, general fitness? Yeah, um, functional movements. Okay. And- is super great like you don't have to lift heavy weight you can do resistance bands you can do lightweight but like squat lunges um you know working on strengthening your back as far as like a row or a deadlift motion like those functional movements are amazing and you do not have to do something heavy yeah um and moderation obviously is key you know like we just talked about you don't want to overdo it in the gym you want to listen to your body but being sedentary isn't good either. Yeah. Um, so like moving well is so important. So move well first, then move often. Yeah. Awesome. That's cool. Um, and then I just wanted to, uh, uh, to ask you, um, if people, well, who do you think would really benefit, um, from someone, you know, to go, going to see a chiropractor. So if someone's listening now and they're suffering from a bit of pain, um, and they've tried different, uh, you know, different things to, to try and get better. Um, but who, who do you think would really benefit the most from going to see a chiropractor? And uh, what would that look like for somebody on their first session that perhaps a little bit nervous or unsure about what it might involve? Yeah. Um, well, I think everyone should see a chiropractor because, again, it, we're preventing things from happening. We're maintaining your health. It's not just when you get injured, because if you think about it, that, that then you have to, you know, it takes longer to heal. Um, it's like you're starting all over again versus us versus um, preventing things from happening. It's like people who brush your teeth. If you brush your teeth every day, you want to take care of your spine every day, too. Mm-hmm. So, yes, most of the time I see people who wait till, you know, it's, it's worse and they've tried everything on their own, which, you know, is just you know, the way of our culture, it's the norm. Yeah. Not saying it's it's good or bad, but that's just how it is. Um, so I just try to educate people on maintenance and wellness is super important too. So once, so for the first time that you come in, you know, I, I do a full throw history um, to see like what's going on, um, a full physical exam. I, um, I look at everything. So to figure out what's going to be the best treatment for you. Mm-hmm. And come up with a specific treatment plan for them. Yeah. Um, so, and I and I start small. If you know someone's never been to a chiropractor, I'm not going to do everything in that first day yeah. because your body can't handle it. So you need a um, whether we work on one area first and then start working on everything else. Okay. You know your body needs to like take time to react to what's. In. Okay. Awesome. Nice one. That sounds great. Um, so at the end of the uh, podcast, uh, Casey, what I always do is just ask the guest about their sort of three areas of inspiration, sort of like, uh, uh, you know, that has inspired them. And that's through uh, a book that they've read, uh, that they'd recommend to others, uh, a film and uh, a person uh, or a movie, as you say, not a film. But um, so starting with uh, starting with a book, um, have you? is there a book that you recommend that others read um, or just a book that has inspired you along along the way? Yeah, um, I love reading, so this was an easy Maybe question. not, <laughs> you might, might not have just one book then. Yeah, well, re- I, I think it was last year I read this book by Carol Dweck called Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. Um, basically, she's a psychologist and she did this research on, there's this idea that there's a fixed versus a growth mindset. So, for example, like fixed meaning someone who thinks, they can't do something, then they just won't do it. They won't kind of understand like how they can get past that and learn and challenge themselves versus someone who has what's called a growth mindset. 
they understand that they're not there yet or at that level. So they learn that they see that failure Mm -hmm. as an opportunity to learn. So I feel like that I like resonated that because I feel like that's like me. Like I'm, I'm always trying to figure out, um, and learn more things. I'm not just like kind of stuck in my way. Like if someone says like, Oh, this may be a better way to do this. Then I totally take that into consideration and, yeah. and understand for myself so I can like help my patient the best way possible. So I'm always trying to jump through those hurdles and, and understand things better. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Nice one. And what about uh, a film that has inspired you? Yeah. Um, I, Really, I just actually watched the documentary called RGB on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Okay. Or RBG, yeah. Um, she's, like, super inspiring. Like, yeah. just her story of her persistence and, like, how she wanted to help, you know, create equal opportunities for men and women. Yeah. Um, so, for example, like, chiropractic is a predominantly male field, and that's obviously something to do with our culture, but, you know, people think men are stronger than women obviously that's still you know that's changing um and i want to be a part of that change so i when i first started um my first year as a chiropractor i did get that you know questioned a lot Mm -hmm. you know for my size and and being a woman like how can i do this but obviously you know i broke that stereotype with you know my after evaluating them and adjusting them and you know showing them that that's obviously not true but yeah i would hope to be a part of that change cool that's awesome and what about a person um so actually my mom she oh, inspires yeah. me every day she's amazing yeah. she she's i feel like she's done it all she she's managed like various programs in substance abuse and child welfare she's written a book and yeah she has her own business as a mental health care practitioner but she still has time for you know her family mm-hmm. and to be there for them so yeah i that that's a super strong positive role model in my life cool that's great thanks for that casey um and yeah. before you go um have you got any what are your sort of future business plans what's going on with your work at the moment um and also uh what's the best way for people to get in contact with you if they've listened to this um and you know they want to book an appointment or have a question for you what's the best way for people to uh yeah get in contact yeah so um i actually have some exciting news i'm opening up a fourth office with the team that i'm working with right now um so we have four locations and i'm helping open up that fourth office in another part of west l.a Mm -hmm. Um, So it's super exciting to be a part of um, the build out and and that whole process. So we'll be expanding um, our access to people and more people. So that's exciting. And the best way to contact is you can direct message me on Instagram. So Dr. Casey Cairo, or you can email me Dr. Casey E at gmail.com. Also, you can call me at my business number which is also on my on my website drkcairo.com okay brilliant cool well thanks again casey for for coming on i've really appreciated it and the time that you've given up and uh because i know you're super busy and uh yeah giving us all that information so yeah thanks again for coming on really appreciate it yeah no problem it was great okay cool cool guys well i hope you enjoyed the episode and i'll catch you guys soon peace mm-hmm.